morning, everybody, and welcome to EAG Church Online. My name is John, and like every Sunday, we are so excited to have you joining us today. Hey, if you've just arrived, why don't you leave us a comment telling us who you're watching with and where you're watching from? Or if you've got something more personal and serious that you'd like to share with us, you can put that in the comments as well. Or you can message us privately, either through social media or our website, www.eagrm.org. Just drop us a line and we'll get in touch with you right away. Now, you know what time it is. Now's the perfect time to get a Bible in one hand and a big old sweet tea in the other, although maybe not that big. <laughs> and let's get ready for another incredible morning of online church. Amen. God, we thank you that we are the redeemed today. We stand as your sons and daughters, not by our own goodness, not by our own might, but by your grace and your grace alone. God, we thank you for your mercy today. Mercy is withholding from someone what they do deserve, and grace is giving someone what they don't deserve. And how many of you are thankful for the mercy of God today? mercy God let's sing this truth together what love could remember what love could remember no wrongs we have done omniscient all knowing he counts not their son thrown into a sea without bottom or shore our sins they are many his mercy is more would wait what patience would wait as we constantly roll what father so tender is calling us home he welcomes the weakest the vilest the poor our sins they are many his mercy is more praise him together praise the lord his mercy is more What riches of kindness he lavished on us His blood was the payment, his life was the cost We stood neath the debt we could never afford Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more With all of your heart, praise the Lord His mercy is more in your mercy, God. Amen. Let's take some time just to thank God for His mercy out loud. Oh, we thank you for your mercy, Jesus. Oh, you give us what we don't deserve and withhold from us what we do deserve, Jesus. Well, hello everyone. Here we are again 
Our series on the home field advantage about family and all type relationships is beginning to wind down. We've got this message and then we've got one more next week on Father's Day. So I hope that you're learning and growing from all these messages and our guest uh, ministers and speakers as well, not guests uh, outside of our church, but ministers in our church. And so it's exciting, you know, that we all have experience with relationships and hopefully it's all good. And so the point of the message series is if we stay close to home, on, in God's word and what the Lord says about family and relationships, I tell you, we're going to live a blessed life. We have an advantage over the world because we get it. We know that we are made in God's image and we know about marriage and the way that things should go. And so there, there's a lot that we can learn. And so today we want to talk about finding Mr. or Miss Right. And I think that's a key issue that every young person has. And you might be thinking, well, I'm already married and, and I, I already got this figured out. Well, listen, this will still be good information for you to pass on to your kids or grandkids, despite their ages, when they begin to wonder about finding the right person. There are some questions, questions that were submitted to kids and the kids' answers about love and marriage. Is it better to be single or to be married? And Anita, age nine, says, it's better for girls to be single, but not for boys. Boys need somebody to clean up after them. Another question, how do people in love typically behave? And Wendy, age eight, when a person gets kissed for the first time, they fall down and don't get up for at least an hour. What should you look for in someone to date? Christine, age nine, says, beauty is only skin deep, but how rich you are can last a long time. Another group of children were asked, what does love mean? Billy, only four years old, said, when somebody loves you, the way they say your name is different. You just know that your name is safe in their mouth. I like that. Jessica, age eight, says, you really shouldn't say I love you unless you mean it, but if you mean it, you should say it a lot. Love is when a girl puts on perfume and a boy puts on shaving cologne and they go out and smell each other. The final one is love is when you tell a guy you like his shirt and then he wears it every day. Well, that's cute little fun kid stuff about love. And, and we know with kids, you know, those type of things begin to get generated in their hearts and minds. But in Genesis, in fact, in several places in the Bible, we have some of the greatest love stories that can ever be told. And the one I want to read for you today comes from Genesis 29. Beginning with verse 16, now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel was lovely in form and beautiful. Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, I'll work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than to some other man. Stay here with me. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. Isn't that sweet? It only seemed, seven years only seemed like a few days because he was so in love. Lord, may that be our heart's attitude, that, that our love lives with our families, just the time flies because there's love there and it's wonderful. And Father, I just pray that you'll speak to our hearts today, that we can learn the things that you want to teach us. In Christ's name, amen. Well, I stand here today, you know, having my own love story with my wife, Nancy. There we are, 41 and a half years ago, uh, October 20th, 1979, when we got married. And so, you know, the time puts years on your life, but, but I thank God for that beginning. We have another picture here when uh, I was in the Air Force several years later. And so, so we were young once, and, you know, we didn't have kids at one time, but then, of course, we did. We have five wonderful kids that we love and care for. And, you know, we all have our story, and it's different, and it's wonderful, and it's beautiful how God brought us together, how God is keeping us together. But I want to cast a vision for you today that society does a lousy job at. I want to give you hope that marriage is God-ordained if it's wonderful. If you don't have that experience, I hope you'll hold on. So this me message today is for everybody who hopes that someday to find that special somebody that they're going to marry, that, that you're going to say those vows on the altar, that as long as you both shall live, you want to keep them. Uh, this message is for those who have found that person, and they are married, but they need to keep that love alive and keep growing and spice it up every now and again. So here's the little secret that every married couple here knows that maybe single people and you teenagers have never heard. Your present that will eventually be in your past has the potential to show up in your future, good and bad. Married people thought that once they got married, it would be like a new beginning. All the past would be the past. It'd be gone. You know, it wouldn't show up again. And that they're just headed into a new future together. But I'm telling you that what you're facing now will follow you around. 
Your choices, your character, your past relationships have a way of showing up in your life in the future. Let me say it like this. I have never met a married couple that had marriage problems. What I see are people with problems who got married, you know, problems that they didn't resolve first before they got married or, or issues, and single people problems followed them to the altar, and after they got married, these problems began to show up. Marriage problems are things like, you know, do we squeeze the toothpaste in the middle or at the bottom, or do we each have our home tube, right? Which way does a toilet paper come off the roll? That's a marriage problem. Who pays the bills? Who buys the groceries? Who cleans the house? Who mows the grass? Do we celebrate Christmas on Christmas Eve or Christmas morning? How do we disciple and discipline our kids? You know, these are marriage problems that the couple decides is they're together. What really happens is the single people come into marriage with problems. They drag their past into the present. And so what you're doing now, folks, even if you're 14 or 15 teenagers or, or will matter 10 or 15 years from now, especially if there are issues that you don't deal with. And the reason that many people don't pay attention to those issues and they get into trouble when they get married is they believe a myth called the right person myth. The right person myth. And the right person myth goes like this. If I meet or marry the right person, everything's going to be all right. Do you know how someone knows if they have met the right person? They have chemistry. They're like, well, we just think about each other all the time. We, we, we both love to go to the ocean and take walks on the beach. We, we both like to eat the same kind of food. You know, and, and we have this chemistry, and it's awesome. We just think about each other all the time. And they believe they've met the right person. And, and here, what else they believe? They believe that no one in the history of the world has ever loved like they loved. No one has ever felt like they felt. They're, they're just so infatuated with one another. No, no, their mother, their grandmother, no, no movie that they've seen, nothing surpasses what they feel in love. And the problem is they did not have anything but chemistry when they got married. They didn't know much about relationships, that people don't know a whole lot about true love. They thought, I don't have to be good at relationships because they're the right person. They're going to be good at relationships and it's going to be all right. I don't have to be patient because she's never going to do anything to make me have to be patient because she's the right person. And guess what happens? Listen, single people, listen, teenagers, you need to know this. You're going to be so much smarter than other people. You know what happens? They have problems. And guess what kind of problems they have? They don't have chemistry problems. They have relationship problems because they're in a relationship. They didn't do anything to prepare for the relationship. They just thought love will keep us together. Our passion will be enough. Our chemistry will, will, you know, take care of everything. And so they start having problems. And guess what suffers? The chemistry. They don't want to do things together anymore. You know, they, they, they change. And where it has been so passionate and sexual and fun, it's not working now. They're married. They got married because of all this chemistry and everything. And now they're having problems. And so the guy, he's really confusing. He thinks, we just need to have more sex. That'll fix it. And the girl thinks, that's not how it works. That's not going to help. And suddenly there's all this tension and confusion. The very thing, the reason they got married, the chemistry starts to die because they're not good at relationships. It's because they believe the myth. If I find the right person, everything will be all right. And then someone has the idea, usually the woman. She'll say, I know what's going to help bring us closer together and get our chemistry back. Let's have a baby. Yeah, that's brilliant. Let's bring another human being in to the mess that we're having right now. And the guy thinks, hey, having a baby involves sex. That's a great idea. And so they have this baby thinking it will fix the relationship because they've lost the passion. They've lost the chemistry. And guess what? Now it's even harder. And now there's even another person involved. So he's at work one day and notices some nice lady that he's been working with that he's never paid attention to. But she begins to pay him a little bit attention. She, or, or she's out somewhere and meets this wonderful caring man. And after a while, they pour, pour, pay more attention to these other people than they pay attention to themselves in their marriage. And you know what they think? They start to think, I know what's wrong with my marriage. I married the wrong person. And I've now found somebody that they're the right person. Friends, this is a trap. This is, this is the way it goes if we don't believe the truth about what God's Word says. Now, let me tell you, it doesn't have to be that way. This doesn't have to be the story of your life. There is a different approach, but you're not going to find it on TV. You're not going to hear it on the Internet or see it. You'll only find it in the Bible. If you date with the mindset that if I can just find the right person, everything will be all right, you've bought into a fairy tale lie. So I want to give you a new 
a paradigm, a new way of thinking about dating and relationships, forget about finding the right person. The question you need to ask, are you the right person? Are you becoming the right person? Think, this is what nobody ever told you. That's why after years of marriage, people wake up on the other side of the bed and they wonder, we're more like roommates than soulmates. How did this happen? And if, and if you would sit down and come up with a list of all the things that you would look for in a future boyfriend, a girlfriend, husband, or wife, I want them to be this or that. I do not want them to have this problem or that hang up. But the question every single person wanting to be married someday needs to ask is, are you the person the person you are looking for is you looking for? Are you the person the person you are looking for are looking for? You know, see, finding the right person won't work if you are not becoming the right person right now. So are you being intentional? Are you working towards becoming the person, the person you are looking for, is looking for? Or are you just believing that myth out there that someday you'll just meet the right person? Here, here's an interesting thing. When you open the pages of Scripture, you will find little help about finding the right person. So I can't give you any Scripture today about finding the right person except to pray and trust the Lord's leading. But there's a whole lot in the Bible that helps you and I to become the right person. It's going to be attractive to who it is that God sends our way. And this should not come as a surprise because God created us in his image. He created the marriage relationship. He created us to be ready for that relationship for, and for it to last. See, love is completely different from attraction. Attraction comes and goes. Love lasts forever. Many people confuse love with, with attraction, and that's why relationships don't last. But real love fuels passion in a marriage relationship. Real love is the glue that keeps you together when things get tough. Real love keeps friendships close through the years. And see, when you confuse attraction with real love, it starts you down a road that you don't want to be on because eventually, if you stay on it long enough, there's going to be unrealistic expectations that pop up. The Bible teaches there's no such thing as a perfect relationship because two are imperfect people, you know, come together in the in the God's plan of marriage. And so there are sometimes those unrealistic expectations. And then, then you have to deal with unmet needs because many people accept the myth that if you're in love, you'll naturally know what the other person needs and how to meet their needs and everything will just flow good. But in marriages, most of us try to meet our spouse's needs based on what we need. You know, we, we try to do those things that, that we want done, but that's not what's ministering to them. Many times parents encourage their kids based on what encourages them. And when you do that, you're not going to meet their needs because everyone is unique, you know. What happens next in this downward spiral are harmful words begin to come. You hit a nerve when you don't meet someone's needs. They get frustrated after day after day after day. And then come insults, criticism, cut downs, hurtful words. And it's all out of frustration of not being loved in the way that you need to be loved or you want to be loved. And when that happens, it, it, and if it goes on unresolved for too long, bitter feelings begin to be formed. And that's bad. And if you don't deal with those bitter feelings, that root of bitterness is going to grow. And the way you deal with it is love and forgiveness. Love and forgiveness before that whole relationship gets poisoned. And if you don't deal with that, then the most dangerous thing that will happen is total apathy. When, when, when you're just going through the motions, there's no chemistry. That's long gone. There, there, there's no love. There's no feelings. And you begin to think what I just said, that you married the wrong person because it's not working out. Now, you just have a wrong concept of where real love is. You're confused uh, attraction with love, and it sets you on the path of that destructive relationship. See, it's natural to want to hear someone say, I love you. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. You're the most important person in my life. I have so much respect for you. When you walk into the room, it just lights up. I, I get excited. When I hear the car pull up in the driveway, I'm so glad that you're home. I can't wait to, to give you a greeting. There's the thumbprint of God on your soul. We're de designed to have had intimacy with God and with one another in a very deep way. But it won't happen accidentally. That's what I'm telling you. You have to be intentional about becoming the right person. So let me give you a list from Scripture to help you. I'm struggling and I'm suggesting that you practice these things every time you're on a date. 
in every conversation, in every encounter you have, whether that person is a candidate for you to marry or just, just on a friendship level, uh, well, you develop you know, these sweet dating skills. And here are some starting points and how you can become the person, the person you are looking for is looking for. And if you're already married or dating, these things will help you enhance your marriage and your relationship. And it's found in one of the most famous chapters in the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, if you want to turn there and follow. If not, we'll, we'll print some of the scripture here for you. The Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Paul to write these things down so that we know what real love is. And by the way, I didn't say it at the beginning, but God is love. You know, God is love. So if anybody knows anything about love, it's the one who is love, who's given us a book of love. And so this is where we can find what we need. So here's how it starts out. The Bible says love is patient. Here's what it means. Love never pressures the other person. Love creates as much space and margin as, as the other person needs. If you're in a relationship and the other person always pushing you, rush, 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 do this, do that, be like, they're not loving you. And this suddenly uh, doesn't appear as a virtue because you say, I do. It develops over time. Every day you need to get better at being patient. I mean, it's, it's something I work on all the time, learning how to be patient. Secondly, it says love is kind. You know, that, kind of is, that word is kind of a wimpy word. A, a better word might be considerate. Love is considerate. Do you know what that means? It means you take the other person's feelings into consideration. Love is kind. Love is considerate. I'm not suggesting that you work on this uh, after you think you found the right person. I'm saying work at it all the time in every relationship right now. If you're a young person, you, you know, be kind and considerate to older people in the church where you go. Older folks, be kind and considerate to the younger people who like things differently, who, who might even like the music louder than you like. Just realize, be considerate one of another. Work on it all the time so that by the time you do find that special person, they think that you are the most patient, kind, considerate person they've ever met. Let me tell you what the right person myth people think. They think, I don't need to be kind. I don't need to be considerate because if I meet the right person, they're going to be so perfect. It won't require that of me. Well, that, uh, friends, I'm telling you, that's, at the, that's a lie. I heard about these kids were in their attic reading old letters that their parents written years ago when they were in that you know, lovey-dovey stage where the chemistry was right. And the boy said to the girl, these aren't the names I call each other now. So you know what I'm talking about. He goes on to say here in 1 Corinthians 13, love does not envy. A whole lot of couples, maybe some people you know, split up over this. You know what envy is? Envy is, I don't feel good about me, so I can't let you feel good about you. Now that's kind of a simplistic idea about it, but I'm going to drag you down. And I'm going to drag you down and drag you down. And some people and some of you have a problem with this because of the way you were raised. And if you don't fix this now, you're going to drag that into every relationship. You're going to be a Debbie or Dudley Downer just dragging people down. People get married and she might be a little bit more successful than him and he doesn't like it. Or he might be more outgoing and she doesn't like it. And, and do you know how you can fix this? When, you, when you're on a date, when you're, when you're with people and they tell a story, instead of trying to, to one-up them with your story, just listen and appreciate what they said. Wow, that's awesome. You hit a home run at the softball game last night. Wow, let me see those muscles. That's incredible. You didn't tell me that your dad, you know, you know don't tell them that your dad played for the New York Yankees and your brother just got drafted to the Atlanta Braves. Let them bask in the glory of, of their little achievement. You know, let them feel special. Practice this all the time. Celebrate other people's stories without having to always insert your own and take center stage. And, and you're going to see that this works great. But this is not natural to us. We, we want to, you know, put ourselves out there. We got to work at this. The Bible goes on to say love is not boastful or proud. And I know what you're thinking. Time out. This all sounds like the worst state ever if I got to do all this stuff. You know, let's be patient, let's be kind, don't envy. And we'll just drive around and around and around, run out of gas, and you'll say, hey, where do you want to go to eat? And she'll say, I don't know, wherever you want to go to eat. He said, well, no, I want to go where you want to go. And, and you think, you know, all this love and consideration, you know, how's that going to work out? Well, let me just ask you this question. For those of you who have seen friends or family or loved ones separate or get divorced, or you've seen your parents or others, you know, have tough times, don't you think that maybe if your father was a little bit more considerate about how your mom felt, things might have been better in their life? Or if your mother was more patient, or they showed each other more kindness, or if there wasn't so much competition? Do you think if there wasn't so much pride, some of your mothers or fathers or people you know had so much pride they could never admit they were wrong? 
Do you think that they would have had some of this? They might have kept the relationship together. It made it better. The answer is yes, absolutely. So why wouldn't we want to start out from the beginning getting it right? See, do you realize the opportunity you have? You've, you've got time now, young people, to allow God to transform you, to mold your character, you know, to help you become godly in Christ Jesus. So you've got to decide you know, to become who God intended you to be. So when that time comes where that someone special comes your way, you're going to be the person they're looking for. Do you know that if you met the person of your dreams this week, they might not be attracted to you because you've not become the person they look for? I mean, you might be good looking. You might be physically attractive. But I'm going to tell you, what I, these things we're talking about, they are very attractive and they last your life. Fifthly, love does not dishonor. Do you know what that means? It means that you will never ever create regret or do something that others will regret. You never be part of someone else's regret story. You'll never be the one people thought, I never wished I answered the phone. I never wished I said yes. I never went out with that person. You'll never be the one to cause regret in someone's life. Here are some other words to spell this out. Does not behave disgratefully or dishonorably or indecently. What serves you well while you're living your life, doing what you want, living for now, forgetting the rules, and ignoring the advice of your parents will destroy you later. Okay? And I want you to get it right. Start to learn to honor a man and a woman, you know, so that later when you meet that special person, you'll be the best honorer ever, if that's a word. All of us married people thought that once we got married because we said, I do, to the right person, honoring would come easy because they were so awesome. It will, it will just get pulled out of me, but we, we have to work at this. Paul goes on to say, love is not self-seeking. Now stop there and let me ask you a question. Does any of this come naturally? No, it doesn't. The, 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 these are supernatural things that happen in us that are deposited in us by the Holy Spirit of God. To allow your relationships to be fined by those things that could, you could feel for hundreds of people is insane. That's a fairy tale. We, we, we need to decide from this point on that we're not going to search for the right person. We're going to put all, all of our energy into becoming the right person. Did you hear that? You know, if, you, if you're out there searching for the right person, you'll find someone that might be the right person, that looks like the right person. But if you concentrate on becoming the right person, I promise you when that right one comes along, things will click and it won't just be a, you know, the honeymoon's over kind of a sage. You can enjoy a honeymoon type atmosphere your whole marriage. So here's the deal. Every Saturday in most every city in this country and countries around the world, a woman will put on a lovely white gown. She'll look as beautiful as she's ever looked. A guy will get dressed in a tuxedo and look better than he really looks and stand at an altar. They'll exchange rings. A pastor will lead them in making promises and, ex and keeping vows that they can't fulfill. They're, they're meant to keep them. They, they want to keep them, but they couldn't. Why? Because they weren't prepared. They overlooked a principle that we know is true for every other area of life, but for some reason, we neglect it when it comes to relationships. And it's that promises are no substitute for preparation. This is true in business. It's true in sports. It's in school, in life. People think in relations, I can, I can promise my way past my lack of preparation just because I say I do doesn't make you able, able or capable. It only makes you accountable. And when you're accountable for something you are incapable of doing, you become miserable. And there's a lot of people that are miserable. They have a great wedding. There's a great marriage that started, but, but then trouble comes. And there are many people that are miserable because they know what they're accountable for, but they can't keep their promises because they weren't prepared ahead of time. Young people, I'm giving you this message because you can begin to be prepared. And, and here's what's going to happen. If you don't listen to what I'm saying, you're going to get married one day. And if you're not prepared, and none of us are fully prepared, let me just say that. We're going to have to work through things, but we can get some of these basics in gear, okay? And what might be even worse is you'll be tempted to ignore someone's past track record, you know, because you've got chemistry and, and you're failing to see where their life is headed and you just kind of hitch on for the ride and they make a promise, but they can't keep it because their past, you know, is so heavy with bad stuff. They're just going to continue with that way. A lack of preparation cannot be trumped by a promise. Let, let me give you a couple of scriptures here from the wisest person who ever lived. Proverbs 14, 8 says, True, the wisdom of the prudent is to give thought to their ways. A prudent person is someone who understands that life, all of life is connected. 
what happens yesterday will impact tomorrow. What happens in my past can show up in my future. The prudent person understands that today is connected to tomorrow. What I do at home, school, at church, when no one is watching, it all matters. It's all connected. The ways, you know, prudent in their ways, we're talking about behaviors, patterns, trends, pathways. Ways are what make us predictable. It's how you know what someone will do or say before they do it. We have our ways about us. So, so here's what this is saying. The wise person gives thought to his ways because the best indicator of my future behavior is my present behavior or my, even my past behavior. The verse goes on to say that the folly of fools is deception. The point is that whereas the prudent person looks at the direction of someone's life, the path they're taking, where they're headed, the foolish person doesn't pay attention. They, they just think I'm in love and, you know, he's handsome or she's pretty. We like each other. We want to be together. And they have no consideration what their life has been. Here's the second verse, Proverbs 14, 15. It says, a simple man believes anything, but a prudent man gives thought to his steps. When you fall in love, you believe anything. It, it, it's okay. We're, we're in love and we have a song. Yeah, but your dad goes, does he have a job, Right. It's a proven fact that when you're in love, chemicals are released in your brain that make you a little crazy. You're, you're lovesick, and it's real, and it can be a good and a God thing. But a simple person believes anything. They'll go along with anything. He'll say, I know I've got these bad habits, and I go to church, and blah, 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 but when we get married and we get together, I'm going to change. Yeah, write that down. Okay, I've seen it so many times where, where that's how people get married, making promises they can't keep because they're not prepared. And the other person is just a simple person who believes anything. They're, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll check it out. See, the simple believe anything, but look at the contrast that. But, but a prudent man gives thought to his steps. Do you know why this is important? Because when you look at a person's steps, you can tell where they're going. Promises don't mean anything if you can tell the steps they are taking is leading in the wrong direction. If all the decisions of their life has been destructive, then, then you know, what makes you think it's going to change just because you get married? Have they had an experience with God or, you know, are they, are they really changing? And here's one more statement. The past is a better indicator than a promise. God's word is awesome. His promises are backed up with an incredible track record of God's faithfulness. So if you want to be the person the person you're looking for is looking for, I want you to commit to the process now of becoming that person. Young person, become that person. Single person, become that person. Yeah, it doesn't mean that you can't date from time to time or you can't interact with people. But in the process, become that person that's patient, that's loving, that's kind, that's compassionate, considerate, and all these things. And so that, that even if someone doesn't come along that's the one you're going to marry, that, that your life is being full of great godly character. Three quick things to get you started in this process. Number one, address your unresolved childhood issues. An expert says if you attempt to build intimacy with someone before you've done the hard work of becoming a whole person, every relationship will be an attempt to fill the hole in your heart. So you need to become whole or healthy now before you can even be a benefit to that person that you're married. If you're mad at your mother, your father, if there's been abuse or, or things have happened, you need to forgive. You, you need God to, to help, him, you know, help you forgive. You need to get healed and become whole yourself so that you don't carry any of these things into your marriage relationship. You might be putting them down really good, but I promise you they'll surface later if you don't honestly deal with them before God now. Ladies, then I would say to you, don't allow yourself to be treated like a commodity. A little help from the world of fishing. Do you know how a fisherman determines how to bait his hook? It depends on what he's fishing for. And ladies, if you fish with your bodies, you're going to catch body snatchers every time. And, and here's what you'll say later on. You'll say, all men are alike. No, just all the ones that you dated are alike because that's who you fish for. Ladies, God created you to be the crowning glory of creation. He created you to be beautiful and lovely and all these things. But you are more than just your body. You're more than just your pretty face. Be attractive with your love for God. Be attractive with your faithfulness to God. Be attractive with these characteristics that I've been talking about. And guys, on, on the flip side of that, you know, you know, you know look, at, look at all these ladies that, that could be a potential marriage partner for your life. You know, begin by being friends with them. Treat them like you would a good, you know, actual sister or just a spiritual sister. You know, a young lady that's in church, you know, just treat them the right way. Don't, you know, don't treat them in a way that will dishonor them. 
And thirdly, I would say this strongly, save sex for marriage. Sex is more than just physical. It's why the Bible says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. People say, well, it's just sex. It's just physical. I can hook up with this person, that person, and just walk away. It's not real love. Well, no, you can't. Yeah, you can walk away and move on to the next one. But God says flee from sexual immorality, flee from that situation because he knows the damage that sexuality can do when it's misused. Jesus taught that sexual intimacy is intended by God to be reserved for a husband and wife in the bonds of marriage in the context of an exclusive permanent commitment to one another. Our culture says sex outside of marriage is okay. Our culture says a whole lot of other things about sex and relationship. But hear me, folks, everybody. Love is not the password that says we can have sex. Marriage is the password that says, okay, now you can have sex. You're married. You're committed to one another. Hebrews 13, 4 says it like this. Marriage is, marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. In the movie, The Count of Monte Cristo, it's, it's a movie that I like a lot. It stars Jim Caviezel, and he's this seagoing guy. And he's just, Jim Caviezel is the same character that played Christ in The Passion of Christ. And he, he's just got this real uh, humble look about him. And he's a character that, that gets falsely accused, and he gets sent to this prison, you know, out in the middle of the ocean somewhere. And when he goes and, and checks in, he, he tells the, the jail, he said, listen, I'm innocent. And, and the guy says, I know you are. And then he says back, are you mocking me? He said, no, I know you. He, I said, I know. There, there's plenty of prisons in Paris where they could have kept you, but, but they send everybody here that could be dangerous, you know, that are innocent. And so, so he gets this bitterness begin because he's been wrong, but there's a priest in prison with him. And the priest says, God is going to work it out. And he says, I don't believe in God anymore. And the priest says, that's okay. God still believes in you. Friends, listen, God never stops believing in you. you. You might have launched into marriage or a couple of marriages and they didn't work out for whatever reason. And you might be thinking, I'm, I'm giving up on relationships. I'm giving up on God. Listen, God never stops reaching out to love you. He never stops reaching out to heal you. And, and when I began to understand how much God loves me and that he unconditionally loves me no matter what, it frees me to love others the way that I've been loved, right? We need to do that. It frees me up to take a risk, you know, in making total commitments to other people, you know, even if it, if it might hurt your heart. I, I'm going to let you know a little secret here. You know, don't focus on loving God more, which we should do. Focus on knowing how much God loves you. Because when you know how much God loves you, it will change everything. When you understand how much God loves you and cares about you. Now let me close this message. And we're going back to 1 Corinthians 13. The chapter ends in the most amazing way. In verse 11, it says this. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put childish things behind me. Now with this in mind, let me ask you. How does every childhood fairy tale end, right? The prince rescues the princess. You know, he, he kills the fire-breathing dragon. They, they run away to some little cottage somewhere and they live, come on, you could say with they live happily ever after. That's what happens in children's stories. If the right people can get together, the rest will take care of itself. Some of you have been approaching relationships like a child. You've been thinking like a child. You've been acting like a child. You've been believing this childish fairy tale that if you fight, find the right person, everything is going to be all right. But it's time, I'm telling you, to put away those childish thoughts and that childish way of thinking and to become a man or become a woman and say, listen, I'm not going to focus so much on, on the looking out there for who I want. I'm going to look to God. I'm going to be trusting in God. I'm going to start becoming the person I need to be. You know, and you might, I'm telling you, th this is not just what I want for you. Trust me, your parents want this for you. Your friends want this for you. Your Heavenly Father wants this for you. And the Holy Spirit will help you to fulfill this and become the person that the person you are looking for is looking for. And you find them and they find you, you you're, gonna, you're in store for an awesome life and a wonderful adventure that God has for you. Amen. Father, I just thank you for your word today. I thank you that it's true. God, I thank you that we are to live in a different way, that we are to take the home field advantage. 
God, we are to take the advantage that you give us by doing relationships the way that you show us to do it, by, by allowing you to bring those people in our life that will be our mate one day, uh, that, that we can say those vows with great expectancy and hope and joy, that we're going to carry it out because we, we're doing it under the uh, leading of your Holy Spirit. So God minister to people through this message where they need it right now. I pray that people that are headed down the wrong direction will change direction and head back in your direction. I pray for those that have been faithfully doing this, Lord, and still it's been a long time and that right person has not come along. Lord, I pray that you'll answer their prayer. Lord, send that young woman, that young man their way and let them enjoy holy matrimony together. And Father, I just thank you that you love us so much that as we learn that, we just find ourselves just to be at a rest in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, once again, thank you so much for coming to church with us today. If you would like to find out more about EAG, who we are and what we do, then make sure to connect with us at these social media links down below. We would love to hear from you and get you plugged into our church family. Now that's all the time we have for today, but make sure to join us again, same place, same time next week, as we come back together for another beautiful morning of online church. We look forward to seeing you there. And so until we meet again, stay safe, take care, and God bless. So long, everybody.